Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here at uh, Hello Tomorrow, uh, talking about my favorite subject. So uh, with that, we'll get started. So I thought I'd begin with uh, giving you a little bit of mo my motivation here, and that kind of goes something like this. So for uh, decades now, we've been advancing technologies and getting experience with human spaceflight, but the feasibility and affordability of space exploration continues to be extremely difficult. So many of the plans and promises that we've uh, looked forward to have really not been, uh, have not been realized yet. And while we've become very good at uh, conducting robotic missions with either going to the moon or going to Mars with rovers or to the outer planets, uh, manned deep space exploration has really remained elusive stuff. We still have not, have not mastered it. So it is with that kind of context that uh, after spending 10, 20 years of my career looking at a lot of the traditional engineering solutions, looking at advanced materials, advanced propulsion systems, things kind of realizing that that's not going to be enough. We're still going to need more than that. So I wanted to come up with some, something game-changing that really had not been explored yet, and, um, and we'll be talking about that. So uh, with manned space flight, it's extremely challenging. As I mentioned, there are, uh, you have all the food, the water, the consumables uh, that, that we need to maintain the human system. So people are very, uh, are very demanding. Uh, we, like to, we like to breathe, we like to be in a comfortable environment, so it requires thermal control, uh, all the additional support equipment uh, required uh, just to get us there uh, wherever we're going in one piece and alive. Uh, but that's not sufficient. We also need to be, we also need to be healthy. So, and there are a number of uh, health factors combating us against this in, in the space environment. So we have the microgravity impact on bones and muscles. We have an increased space radiation environment from solar particle events, galactic cosmic radiation. Uh, we're recently uh, identifying increased uh, intracranial pressure as causing some long-term uh, vision damage on astronauts. Uh, and we have circadian rhythm changes. So there's a variety of, of medical challenges uh, that are preventing us from even getting there to our destination in a, a healthy state. So I was wanting to come up with a technology and an approach that could really address both uh, multiple issues here, not just solve the water problem or a food problem. So I wanted to see maybe we could knock out a couple of these, of these big challenges. stuff. So, uh, my vision is to basically place a Mars-bound crew in an inactive, low metabolic torpor state uh, during the transit phases of the mission, from the Earth to Mars and Mars and back. And we're going to do this using prolonged hyperthermic stasis and a metabolic suppression. So fairly, fairly simple and straightforward, uh, right? So, uh, so that's our goal. That's what, that's what we've been working towards. Now. Uh, before I get to the actually how we're going to do that, I did want to touch on some of the why. You know, why would you do this? You see this in science fiction, uh, oftentimes where you go into this suspended animation state, and that's generally for interstellar travel. Mars is six months away, so it doesn't take you know a human lifetime to get there. So why would you do this? Uh, on the engineering front, uh, being in a low metabolic state that reduces your consumables. Stuff. So you eat, eat a lot less, you need a lot less fluids. Uh, with being inactive, we can put you in a much smaller environment, much smaller habitat, and that reduces the power demands. Uh, these are all things that uh, drive the mass of the system. Mass translates to propulsive requirements. You know, the propulsive energy is an exponential function. So every time we can reduce the mass on the payload, the people, that uh, has significant impacts on the propulsion system. So. This also enables a number of uh, new uh, options that we can explore uh, by having the crew in this state. So that's all on the engineering front. On the medical, perspe uh, medical perspective, uh, there are a lot of challenges with psychosocial aspects of putting a small number of people in a very small habitat for a very long uh, period of time, potentially up to three years, right? And they're in a very high-stress environment. So at least the transit phases where you're kind of drifting uh, through space in the blackness of space, if we can solve that uh, by basically having everybody sleep, uh, we think mentally uh, they'll be in a much better shape when they actually get to their destination. Uh, there's additional approaches that are enabled for muscle atrophy and bone loss, in addition to just a potential reduction uh, in their impacts uh, being uh, from the reduced metabolic activity. 
Uh, it, it is known to solve the in, increased intracranial pressure uh, that lowers, uh, lowers pressures and prevents some of the eye damage. And there's some early research that we're potential to reduce uh, the acute and long-term radiation damage. So, so that's still early, but something we definitely want to explore. So uh, both engineering and medical aspects we think is beneficial. Generally, you're trading um, technologies or, you know, you benefit in one area at the expense of another. So, uh, so far, you know, we're kind of seeing benefits on both aspects. So, so that's a little bit of the background we're going. Now, when, when I introduce this topic, this is oftentimes uh, brings up a lot of connotations from movies and TV shows and fringe science about, you know, what, it, what exactly we're doing here. So I've kind of wanted to illustrate here where we're at and what our approach is. So, uh, your, you know, your body operates at about 37 degrees. Uh, Celsius, that's kind of your normal uh, kind of set point. Your body always tries to maintain that. Uh, if you start to cool down from there, you go, you'll start shivering. That's your body's response, autonomic response to warm back up. So, so it's trying to maintain that 37 degrees. If you come down from there, you'll go into a hypothermic state. Uh, below that, at about uh, uh, 28 degrees, so uh, you actually start to experience some very uh, significant medical complications. At 27 degrees, your heart will stop functioning. Stuff it is not designed to operate below that. And then you kind of have a sliding scale from moderate to deep to profound hypothermia. So, so uh, while you've probably seen some stories of people recovered from under the ice in a deep or profound state, uh, you know, that's very, uh, very dangerous, kind of a miraculous stories when that occurs. Stuff. So where we're at, we're actually at the 32 to 34 degrees. That's our target temperature. So we're targeting mild hypothermia. Uh, with that reduction, we can get a 50 to 70 percent reduction in metabolic activity. And that is actually standard medical practice for therapeutic hypothermia. This is a clinical procedure that is used in cases of traumatic brain injuries and cardiac arrest. So we're leveraging that, that, uh, that technology. In therapeutic hypothermia, when they uh, cool down the body. They use a number of different systems. These are gel packs or saline injection or transnasal catheters and stuff. So a variety of medical solutions to achieving that. So, so I'll come back and, and touch on that in a moment. But that's, that's kind of where we're at. You will see if you, you know, reading in the papers, occasionally you'll see stories of uh, where this is being applied. You'll read in induced hypothermic coma. Uh, this is generally applied for periods of two or three days. So they'll cool somebody down, hold them at 32 to 34 degrees. Uh, that really gives the body time to recover, uh, relieve some pressure and swelling in the brain, and reduces some ischemic damage uh, that's possible from their injuries. Stuff. So there's lots of, uh, uh, lots of clinical data and case studies that we can leverage uh, for this. Now, in the space environment, we have a number of unique challenges. So primarily being extended duration. Two or three days is not going to be sufficient for getting to Mars or applying that. So Mars is about 200 days out, so uh, ideally we'd like to put people in this state for 200 days. So that's a, that's a little challenging, uh, given where we're currently at. But um, uh, we, th we think we can get there through a gradual expansion. Uh, we're normally targeting 14 days, and there's been some very limited case studies uh, that have shown that 14 days can be, can be achieved through the therapeutic hypothermia already. So, but uh, that's not enough. Uh, with therapeutic hypothermia, it requires level of sedation that create challenges for long-term administration. So these are, you know, you don't want to be giving the human body these sedatives, uh, high-dose sedatives over long periods of time. That's, that's challenging. Uh, we also have to provide nutrition and hydration. So we're not, uh, you know, humans don't actually hibernate. So we're trying to mimic hibernation. Um, because of that, we have to feed and hydrate the body uh, during, this, uh, during this time. So, so I'll come back and talk on that. And then lastly, which is a little more of a programmatic challenge, is we have to um, we really need to test healthy people over periods of weeks or months to achieve this technology. So that's a little bit of a challenge. How do you develop a technology uh, that really requires somebody spending months, uh, months of their time, uh, potentially just sleeping stuff? So we're working on that, and we've outlined a roadmap where we'll gradually expand the capability uh, over time to achieve this. All right. So... Uh, I won't be able to touch on all the aspects, but two of the issue, or items I want to address is our cooling approach. So uh, I mentioned the kind of invasive medical equipment approach currently used in therapeutic hypothermia. 
So we're gonna replace that with uh, basically some pharmaceuticals, new pharmaceuticals that can achieve a similar state. And we're basically trying to mimic the mechanisms that occur when entering hibernation. So we learn uh, about, these, uh, about these drugs and their effects from the animals and can understand them and then trying to replicate uh, eat humans. So basically involves the activation of the adenosine A1AR uh, receptor with uh, two chemicals, the CHA and 8SPT. So, and when we do that, it appears to attenuate thermogenesis. Basically, it resets your body's target point from that 37 degrees based on the amount of drug that's provided. We can control, control it and we can safely lower it down to the 32 or 34, whatever our target temperature is. Right? And, then, and it also suppresses shivering. So two, two advantages. It eliminates the medical equipment and suppresses the shivering, which allows us to uh, reduce the amount of sedation that we're requiring in a number of those sedatives. Stuff. So those were two of our big issues. Now, uh, for the cooling uh, with, this, uh, with these pharmaceuticals, we can then move from a, a medical equipment, uh, saline, gel packs and things, to just an ambient cooling. So we can reduce the temperature of the room and the body will adjust through convective cooling through the skin uh, to whatever our target temperature is. So, so, and these tests have been, uh, have been performed in some, uh, these, I'm actually just showing some rodent results that were performed and they were able to control the core temperature uh, through ambient cooling of the room, two different temperatures there, and they've been uh, subsequently repeated with our team uh, in large animal studies. So, so it's kind of new cooling approach. Our goal is always to simplify the system and uh, you know, the amount of hardware and things we're using as well as uh, just address some of these uh, challenges. Now, uh, we do have to eat. So uh, what we're uh, planning on using here is called a PEG tube, uh, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy. Uh, this permits administration of an enteral liquid solution directly into the stomach. So this can be uh, inserted as, with a pre -flight, simple pre-flight procedure uh, to... Um, uh, basically provide a port, an access port, on the side of your stomach. Um, now, we like it because it does maintain the use of the gastrointestinal system uh, during this procedure. Uh, there are some other approaches uh, where you could use a total parenteral nu nutrition, that's called TP or TPN, where you direct, uh, direct insert to your IV uh, or intravenously, and that's kind of a pre-processed food that would bypass the entire gastrointestinal process and digestive processes. It's kind of post-processed food. Stuff. So this allows us to maintain uh, a liquid solution, liquid diet, normal function in astronauts, uh, as well as it lets them resume normal feeding whenever they get to their destination or whenever uh, they would like to actually uh, in ingest something if they were awake. Stuff. So there's no transition period required versus something like the TPN. So this is called a PEG tube. So this is how we're our approach to uh, feeding and hydration. Uh, so, and this is uh, currently in use in uh, hospitals and um, uh, clinical settings and stuff too. So uh, two of our aspects. So what does all this look like? And stuff. So I won't go through, go through everything uh, here, but uh, our main, main point I like to make is we try and be as uh, non-invasive as possible. We try and minimize access points to the skin. Anytime you do that, those are locations or risks for increased infection. Stuff. Those are all manageable and things can be treated, but you know, when the crew is, is en route to Mars, you have potentially a 20-minute communications delay. So we're depending a lot on advancements in robotics and automated systems to monitor, maintain the crew. So we want to minimize uh, all these sort of risks and such. So most of the uh, wires and lines and things you see here are uh, biometric sensors where we're just monitoring the activity uh, of the crew, uh, crew members. So that's kind of what it, uh, what it looks like. Now... We're not only looking at just the medical implementation of this, uh, we're looking at the engineering aspects. So our current research is being funded through a grant by NASA. And in addition, you know, we gave them this medical solution. They said, well, that's, that's great to assume all that works, but what does it really mean for the mission? So if, if, granted, if you had that, is this really going to be beneficial? And such. So uh, I'll show you a sampling of some of the engineering results. So NASA has their plans on how they're going to go to Mars. They have their engineering designs for a habitat that can send four people uh, on a three-year mission to Mars. So that habitat weighs about 45 tons, so pretty substantial here. Um, if we take our technology and replace some of the normal food stores with the interior liquid interior solution, reduce the volume, 
uh, add in the medical systems, reduce the power levels and stuff, we can cut that mass to about 25 tons. So almost in half. So we get a 45% reduction. And this is using our 14-day torpor cycle, uh, that we call it. So a crew member would be in, uh, inactive for 14 days, then they would be awake for two or three days, and then come back through another 14-day uh, period of activity. And they would go through repeat cycles during the mission. They would be staggered, so that there was always uh, one, one crew member uh, that is active. <clears throat> now, if we can get to the full duration torpor, so 180 days or so, the crew, we can cut this mass in half again. So, uh, and a reminder, the propulsion requirements are an exponential function, so that is uh, significant on the mission in terms of amount of mass you have to launch, as well as the cost, uh, development costs. Uh, the other aspect I like for this technology to tout on is the, the area of sustainability. So we've got to move beyond uh, planning for missions. You know, all the missions are focused on four or six astronauts going every two years, stuff. That's not really a vision. That's just, uh, you know, kind of the flags and footprints sort of approach. If we're really talking about settlement, colonization of Mars, we need technologies that can grow and expand and to support ultimately sending hundreds or thousands of people to Mars. Uh, so uh, estimates put we need about 10,000 people just to have a self-sufficient colony with have a diverse uh, diversity of DNA and aspects um, yeah, amongst the, the kind of populace for long-term survival. Uh, so to address that, we have done the engineering analysis on a system that can take 100 passengers to Mars. Now, in this system, this is assuming full duration torpor. We'd put 96 passengers in, uh, in torpor state. Uh, they'd be undergoing some artificial gravity through a rotating habitat. And we have four passengers that are kind of the active caretakers on the mission, just checking up on everybody and such. So, and that system weighs about two, uh, just shy of 200 tons. So still very reasonable. You could not do this with, without this technology. We could not send 100 people uh, to Mars. You're talking 1,000 tons or more. Stuff. So very, very challenging. So this is another aspect and benefit of this technology that uh, I'd like to tell. Um, a lot of our focus, and I've been talking about on Mar is Mars, kind of very future, that's still 20 years or so away. Uh, but we realize kind of have to, need to have some near-term applications for the technology, uh, so those are being explored. Uh, there's potential uh, uses with organ transplantation, either on the donor side or on the recipient, or both. So, um, critical care in extreme environments. You know, if you could kind of put some pause somebody for uh, days or weeks, that allows you to either find a donor match or get into a safer place or a better, uh, better site for administering care. Uh, there's potentially some therapeutic benefits. We're still looking at that, so a little more of a commercial, uh, commercial feel, but uh, we'll see on that front. Uh, in the near term, we are likely to go to uh, the, the moon before we go to Mars. It's kind of a stepping stone for Mars, and we think we can uh, provide support for lunar colonies. It's very easy to send. Uh, you know, we'll be sending hundreds of people to the moon before we go to Mars and we can provide support there. So we're looking at more of the near-term possibilities stuff on this. All right, and so my final remarks, I just, I do believe this is a key enabling technology to permit human exploration, uh, an extended space flight, not only to Mars, but to other destinations, the asteroid belt, uh, out to the outer planets. Uh, we're looking at those sort of missions. Uh, you're not gonna do it without some breakthrough, game-changing technology such as this. Uh, the metabolic suppression, we think, can solve a number of the medical challenges that we're still trying to, trying to solve and wrestle with, uh, with just space flight in low Earth orbit. And uh, I think it's possible that we, this, te this technology can be ready uh, for the first manned missions uh, to Mars. And uh, so with that, I uh, thank you for your time. Enjoy. Thanks.